Hello. Hello. Can you still hear me? Yes. Great. And now can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Take it away. OK. Okay. <clears throat> Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this workshop. I've uh, really been enjoying it so far, and um, I hope that my talk will fit into this a little bit as well. And I'm going to tell you about a recent paper that, to my shock, is already published um, about how we use connectome spectral analysis to track EEG task dynamics on a sub-second scale. OK, so first of all, why do we need this fancy thing, uh, this connectome spectral analysis, uh, aka network harmonics? So first of all, it's a multimodal approach. And that's always that's always nice where we, when we combine EEG with diffusion and structural imaging. I mean, especially for EEG, um, frankly, it's been a bit of a traumatic experience working with EEG data after having uh, the neat appearance of fMRI for several years. And uh, it's very nice that for this method, we don't have to compute functional connectivity in EEG, which is always a bit of a problem. Uh, also, it was really a lot of fun to use the tools of graph signal processing, because those are really nice and established tools with a large uh, number of publications and uh, background behind it. And uh, last but not least, this theoretical framework of harmonic modes, which we've already heard uh, mentioned several times by now, uh, I find very fascinating and kind of thought provoking. Uh, oh, sorry. And um, so I'm not going to explain in uh, so much detail what uh, these harmonic modes are, but something to understand is that they are naturally ordered by smoothness or spatial frequency. So we have we get this multi-scale representation of brain uh, function or structure uh, for free, basically, without having to do anything else. And um, it also allows for a sparse representation of the EEG signal, which uh, is nice in terms of interpretability and uh, statistical power. OK, just to give you a little idea of what the data is that I'm going to talk about. So on the, on the top two uh, rows, you can see the, the structural data that we use. So we have structural MRIs, and we do parcellation into brain areas, and then our usual diffusion MRI to get our structural connectivity matrix. And just stressing, just stressing this again to a crowd that has probably seen millions of structural connectivity matrices by now to say that this is the, the underlying graph that we use. And this has to be distinguished from the signal that lives on this graph. So this is this graph signal processing framework that I mentioned. And the graph signal in our case now is EEG, high density EEG, which is again combined with these structural images and an inverse model to get the brain activity directly in the space of the gray matter and uh, using the same parcellation that we use for the diffusion imaging, of course. So then we have this signal that lives on the graph. Um, yeah, I already said that. <clears throat> okay. So what do we do next? So these uh, harmonic modes or network harmonics, as I call them, to stress that we're really just using this uh, standard parcellation of 68 brain regions is obtained really simply, although it's a fancy word. So you just have your structural connectivity matrix and you compute your, your graph Laplacian, which is, again, very easy. You just have to do this one operation where you uh, normalize the connectivity matrix. So that's what this uh, degree matrix to the minus 1 half does here. So we don't binarize our threshold. We just use the whole thing. And then we, uh, we subtract it from the identity matrix because it's normalized. And we take the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this graph Laplacian. So it's, it's uh, as simple as that. So the number of network harmonics that we get is the number of eigenvectors, so the number of brain regions. And uh, yeah, the dimensionality of these, of these eigenvectors is, of course, still also the number of brain regions. OK, so what do these look like? So again, we have our structural connectivity graph. And if you think of something very familiar, which is a Fourier decomposition, uh, this is just another domain on which your signal lives. So um, instead of having a circle where you get uh, sine and cosine waves of different frequencies, I mean, usually we think of temporal frequencies, but you can think of them also as spatial frequencies. 
Uh, we now have this graph domain and what we get are these eigenvectors where each entry represents one brain region so you can easily project them back onto uh, an image of the cortex and you get these cool patterns and some of them were already mentioned so for example in this case the third eigenvector the third eigenvalue corresponds to this division between left and right hemisphere and we also have this uh, front to back um, gradient that we saw before and as the as the eigenvalue gets higher, they become more uh, particular, let's say. All right. So um, one question that uh, is not as easy to answer as it might seem is how these network harmonics actually capture the SC structure because, OK, they are eigenvectors. But what does that mean in terms of the network that we're actually looking at? So first of all, um, we have these vectors which are also projected on the brain and which can also be understood in terms of this underlying network that I mentioned. So when you focus on this network representation, maybe it makes more sense what I mean when I say they are basis functions of this, like the eigenvectors of this network, okay? And you can then think of your structural connectivity matrix as a superposition of these eigenvectors because I mean, that's what an eigen decomposition really is. And if you take again the outer product of one of these vectors, which is just illustrated here, then the point, like the entries, AKA brain regions, which have the same value or which have high values with the same sign in the eigenvector will result in a high value in this matrix that results from the outer product. And this matrix again, kind of represents an aspect of the structural connectivity matrix. So this is how connections are represented or projected to these eigenvectors. And you can see, so here are here the, here's the correlation between these outer products, like the entries of these outer product with the original uh, graph Laplacian, which contains the same information as the structural connectivity. So here, if you have a very low, um, if you have a very low correlation, that means that the resulting outer product from combining all these um, eigenvectors is very similar to the structural connectivity matrix. And maybe against expectation, it's not just a monoton monotonous line, but there's actually a best spot basically for when you use 21 of these eigenvectors to represent the structural connectivity, that's when you get your maximum correspondence of minus 0.75 in this case. Um, Okay, so something else that I want to mention is that it's not only, it's not just multi-scale, but what's also an interesting uh, feature of these network harmonics that we get for free again, is that we have this integration and segregation and we've already heard a lot about that. And we can clearly see how the same pairs of brain regions can be integrated in one dimension. So for example, here in network harmonic two, these two points are close together on this axis, on the X axis in this case, but they're largely segregated on this uh, network harmonic three on the Y axis here. So this is how uh, these eigenvectors capture the multi-scale and hierarchical properties of brain networks. Uh, all right, so, okay. So um, now, we want to use these harmonic networks. And I just want to say again that these are still just properties of the underlying structural connectivity. So the underlying graph, we want to use this as a basis for our functional EEG signal. So we're using these source projected EEG data that I briefly mentioned before from 19 subjects and they're performing a phase detection task. So here at time point zero, so on top you see the like let's say EEG representation of the data. So just averaged over all the subjects um, from one to 68 brain regions. And the stimulus is presented here for, for 200 milliseconds. And they're just shown a picture of a face. And this is of course a very easy task for humans. Like we really like looking at faces and it elicits a strong response that is kind of spread out over the entire brain. And uh, yeah, the black lines are just the um, reaction times. Okay, now you can very easily project this EEG data in the space of the brain, of the gray matter, onto these harmonics that I showed before. 
So, I mean, they're eigenvectors, so they can represent any signal on this domain to arbitrary precision. So this is not a projection, it's just a transformation into another space, just like a Fourier transform. And indeed, it's called a graph Fourier transform. And this is what's shown here at the bottom. And you can already see one of the most important things here, which is that we have a lot of these network harmonics starting by maybe around here that have very little signal power. So like the weight, which quantifies how much this, uh, this network contributes to the activity that we observe is very small for most of these network harmonics. So this means that it's actually a sparse basis where most power is in the low frequency. And when I say low frequency, again, I mean spatial frequency, like don't get confused. And it f falls off more quickly than uh, in random networks and also then in the, in the original, let's say, EEG representation where we have uh, brain regions. So if we order the brain regions by signal amplitude, we see that there are some, of course, that have more power than others. But when you transform into this uh, frequency in this graph, uh, in this graph frequency space, then you can see that even when you remain them and you keep the ordering by eigenvalue, which is just an intrinsic ordering, you see this strong fall off where a lot of them are close to zero. So um, we took this to mean that network harmonics are a meaningful basis and they are useful for capturing the functional signal. So that's what we that's what we did, and um, just a small just a small comment here. So the this work this work is a result. Uh, of our attempt to basically find a way to track network activations in EEG over time. And there are, of course, there are other methods that are available for this, but it turns out that EEG is really very noisy and we had a hard time doing something that actually worked. And this is something that really, that really worked. So this dimensionality reduction and kind of compression, let's say, of the signal into the low harmonics, that is something that was really very helpful. And so here we just, uh, I'm just illustrating again, this uh, visual evoked potential. So you can clearly see at the stimulus onset, you have this uh, first bump and then a second bump. And the blue uh, trace is just uh, an average over this overall subject. And now what we did, so we have this representation at each point in time as a spectrum. And we now perform just a normal permutation test to find those networks that uh, actually respond to the stimulus. So that have a significant contribution. And what I'm going to show you next is the result of these statistical tests. So isolating basically those networks that contribute to the processing of the stimulus. So we remove, so we set everything else to zero and we just look at a superposition of those networks. In this case, it's just an example where three networks are significant. We make a, uh, we make a linear superposition of those to then analyze the basically meaningful activation pattern, which is not the same as the full activity pattern. And when we did this, um, so here are now all the network harmonics. So these are spatial frequencies basically, and everything that's in color is significant. And the color just corresponds to the strength of the contribution. And it can be positive or negative because yeah, the polarity is, is important in ERPs, of course. So you can see that we basically find two or maybe three windows or intervals where we have significant activity that captures this processing of phase stimuli. And uh, just to look at what, what these actually look like. So in the early, in this early time interval, when you look at the superposition of all significant networks, you see this frizzy from phase area here in the right hemisphere, which is exactly what is known from the literature. And something that is very cool when you use this framework. Oh, sorry, someone is saying they can't see or hear anything, but that's not true for everyone, is it? Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, all right. So uh, as I said, it's a, it's a superposition of networks. So what is also nice is that you can kind of look at the different uh, networks that are active at any point in time. So for example, we know that network harmonic one is just kind of a global signal that reflects the degree. So like the connectedness of each node. So if you remove this overall kind of increase in activity due to the stimulus, then the remaining network harmonics give you an even clearer picture of what is happening. So then you really have this strong activation of occipital regions, especially of this uh, fusiform phase area. 
And uh, when you use the original EEG representation, so you just test every brain region one by one if it's activated significantly in this time window, all you find is this one region. And this is of course nice, so like it corresponds to what we would expect, but also what I don't like about this approach is that you basically ignore all the other brain activity that's happening. All right, so let's look at this uh, intermediate. So this corresponds to just people kind of seeing the face in the picture, okay? Now look, let's look at this intermediate uh, time window, which is at around 200 uh, to 250 milliseconds. Now you can see strong frontal activations, and this is, uh, uh, this is even more prominent in like the later, uh, in the slightly later time window that I chose here, and uh, these are just these are activations that can be that can be related to decision making. So people had to fulfill the task of deciding if they saw a face or if they saw some scrambled picture of a face. So so this is the interval where people decide what they saw, and again you see these like frontal activations in this pattern, and you don't see anything like this in the in the traditional analysis, let's say. And in this late time window, as maybe can be expected, you see activity in the somatosensory motor network because people are already preparing to respond to the stimulus. And again, you do not see this when you look at just uh, brain region by brain region. So uh, we only have 13 out of 68 of these uh, network harmonics that suffice to capture the test dynamics. And we reproduce major findings from the literature using these harmonic networks. Uh, network harmonics, sorry. I changed the name halfway through writing the paper. Um, okay, so, okay, but this is just showing people pictures and looking at what happens over time. Can we also look at the difference between conditions or put in another way, which um, harmonics are specifically activated related to processing of faces instead of just uh, visual stimuli in general? So we all, as I mentioned, people had to decide if they saw a face or a scrambled image of a face. And so far, I only looked at the faces. Now I'm looking at the difference between faces versus scrambled. And again, this is just the visual evoked potential. And you see that it looks very different from before. And actually, you have this dip around 170 milliseconds, which is a very prominent finding in the literature. It's called the N170. And when you again look at the network harmonics, you see again that out of the 68 possible network harmonics, only quite few of them are activated. A bit surprising is that some of the very high uh, frequency ones oops, are actually also there, but you see that they're very weak. And again, in the early time window shown here on the left, you see this stronger activation of the fusiform of this phase region in phase trials. So anything that is red here means that it's more strongly activated when people look at faces compared to when they look at non-faces. And um, when you look at this middle interval, you first see a strong activate, you first see an activation of frontal regions and then a deactivation of frontal regions, which kind of suggests that people maybe make their decision faster when they see a face. It's a stronger stimulus, they recognize it really fast and they make their decision, that's what I saw. And uh, consistent with that, also in this later time window, you again see stronger activation in somatosensory motor regions as people uh, prepare to respond. Um, so yeah, so we reproduce this N170 that is known from uh, like traditional ERP analysis. We see differences in frontal regions and somatomotor regions that suggest a difference in processing timing, but I have to say that we didn't find a difference in the reaction times. And um, in the ROI analysis, I can only say that we don't really find any interesting results. And um, yeah, just to make it clear, the reason for that is not that there's nothing there and that all that I'm claiming that all uh, like traditional analysis, let's say, are wrong. But um, the reason is that this approach, so to, to, to come to the conclusions, the reason is that this approach is just statistically powerful because we, have these network harmonics that form a sparse basis. So obviously, if you analyze activity in a network, you kind of take all the activity that happens in this network. So you have more activity and it's more easily, it's, uh, you more easily get to a significance, uh, significant activity. Uh, we've also avoided computing functional connectivity, which is always messy because we use this uh, structural connectivity basis, which also gives us this nice multimodal representation. 
And um, yeah, apart from the fact that you need high quality data so far, so I haven't tried it with like lower, lower density EEG, um, this method is actually very simple and fast. So computing all the significant activations and uh, uh, doing all the tests is, uh, it takes like 10 minutes. And you can use these well-developed tools from graph signal processing. And uh, yeah, what I also, what I already mentioned, you have this uh, really connectomics perspective where you have an overlapping multi-scale hierarchical structure of brain networks and continuous changes in these network memberships um, instead of kind of discarding the rest of the brain activity and just focusing on single regions. And also network harmonics are not states, but you have these continuous changes. All right. That's uh, all that I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. And uh, questions, please. Thank you, Katarina. Lovely talk. Merci. Uh, looks like we have at least five questions. So first one from Wong Chen. fMRI can also provide functional signal. What's the advantage of EEG relative to fMRI? Oh. Uh, well, so EEG, well, EEG people like to claim that EEG is a direct measure of brain activity, which is uh, not necessarily super true because it's not like it's measuring spikes, but it is uh, an electrical signal. Plus, the the temporal resolution is huge. I mean, maybe I didn't I maybe I didn't uh, stress it enough, but like these little time windows of significant activation are fifty milliseconds long. So that's not something that you can get with fMRI. But uh, yeah, EEG can also be a pain in analyzing because it's noisier. But yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me pick one for the questions just to have more from the audience. Oh, one from Jiang. Uh, how do these sparse bases compare to EG derived? Is there EG data derived from dimensionality reduction bases? Uh, well, I mean, you could say that this is a dimensionality reduction. And uh, I would say the only the only difference is that it uses an analytical approach. So it uses like this idea of harmonic modes as its approach. But it, you can also like if you if you do a PCA on your data, then you also get orthonormal basis functions. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to ignore this whole physics idea behind harmonic modes, then it can be seen as just another basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of questions about the structural connectivity. So, uh, are they sparse when it obtained deterministically? The answer is, of course, yes for that, I'm sure. And then, how does thresholding affect the harmonics? Uh, okay, so the structural connectivity is definitely a main limitation of this approach because uh, well, there are so many assumptions that already go into this consensus structural connectivity that we use here, including thresholding. So um, the, the answer that I like to give to that is that you shouldn't, I'm not claiming that these uh, network harmonics are canonical in any way. Also, we didn't really test what they look like for single subjects. So I'm sure that the SC has a large uh, impact on these harmonics, especially as you go beyond maybe the first five or something, which seem to be quite stable. But um, since it's a linear combination of modes, you can you should see it more as like a cumulative description of brain activity that arises from from these modes. But definitely, there's still more work, a lot of work to be done to kind of find out more about the stability of these modes, depending on the structural connectivity. But something else that I that I like about this approach is that you could easily investigate what happens to the modes and also to the dynamics of the modes when you change something in the structural connectivity. Like let's say one uh, connection is broken or uh, you have yeah some disorder happening there. Yeah, so to clarify one thing, so you, you use a group consensus. Yes. Yeah, uh, I use a group. It's a, it's a group. Can it work with just the individual ones or are they too noisy or? Uh, yes, they're too noisy. Um. Yeah. Okay. I mean, cool. so you can't really, you can totally do it, but I, I don't know. So then you would have different basis functions for every subject. So that would be the first problem. So it would be difficult to match them. And uh, yeah, you couldn't, you, I, like, there's no reason to trust them kind of over the group connectome. Mm -hmm. uh, the top voted one at the moment is, 
Sebastian's question. So are the GFT weights normalized, i.e. how do you compare low versus high graph frequency power? Referring to slide 19, if that brings uh, it up. 19, oh, here. So normalized. Well, so they, so I normalize the power of the subjects at some point just to not mess things up when I average. But in general, you don't have to, you don't really have to normalize anything because it's just a transformation into another space. So the power of the signal stays the same as with the, with the original EEG data, let's say. So I don't, I just use them as they are. Mm -hmm. uh... Let me see. Uh, why do you choose the modes based on eigen decomposition of the Laplacian rather than eigen decomposition of the adjacency matrix? Interesting question. So, in fact, so in fact, in this case, there because we use the normalized Laplacian, there isn't really. Uh, so the only difference is that. Uh, you yeah you apply this normalization so actually the eigenvectors would look the same so in this case it would be almost the same just the the signs would be reversed um, but in general there are different choices for the graph Laplacian that you can make in this case we use this normalized Laplacian because the sizes of the regions are very different and this somehow takes care of that but yeah just to fit it into this framework of uh, harmonic modes, we use the graph Laplacian, but uh, it's definitely true that the graph Laplacian encodes the same information as the structural connectivity in this case, because we use all the weights and we don't binarize or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick one for one of Paul's ones, I guess. How robust is the approach if the data are noisy? Well, I guess EG is always noisy. So, <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear that. How robust that. is this approach if the data are noisy? So uh, at first we tried to decompose uh, single trials and that didn't work at all. So yeah, the data are very noisy, but it's robust because A, it's an easy task with, which elicits a strong signal and uh, B, there's many trials that we average and also we use this sliding window. So the reason that I don't use single time points is that that was also too noisy. And I, I mean, when you look, when, when I now look at single subjects, they do look quite similar. So, and I use it and I tried it also with a different task from different subjects, like the same processing pipeline. And it also, it also worked. So you do have to do some averaging because of the fact that it's noisy EG data, but uh, then once you get there, it's robust enough. Cool. All right. Thank you.